Somewhere within the billions and billions of base pairs of an organism's DNA are very specific affinities for very specific reactions that, over time, eventually create more of that DNA. How this complex reaction we call life occurs is dependent on the organism and their environment. In most instances, DNA has learned that organisms struggle in maintaining the viability of the DNA inside them for long periods. Diseases, predators, natural disasters, all of these things can potentially kill an organism and cease the existence of a genome. Thus, in just about every organism on Earth, the genome jumps ship into an offspring or progeny. Once it's duplicated itself, well, DNA doesn't care. That's not what it evolved to care about. Even if we do manage to keep ourselves alive a lot longer than our genome expected, our DNA, the thing that defines what makes us us, never learned or evolved to deal with the idiosyncrasies within our cells that manifest over great periods of time. In the last video, we learned that aging can be considered a reversible disease. It's simply a disruption of our epigenome, or our body's internal mechanisms for reading our DNA. As we get older, our epigenome gets cluttered and not all tasks within a cell are working for the same goal. That makes our cells inefficient and over time, ineffective. This is bad news, but luckily, there's no medical reason we can't clean up these errant proteins and revert it back to the way it used to be. The composition of a cell's epigenome is stored in what we call an analog format. It exists physically in the proteins and enzymes floating about. If we visualize a similar analog format, like this word written in pencil, even when some of the original information is lost, we're able to inspect it very closely to find the tiny compressions left behind when it was originally written. We can then reconstruct the information. Because our epigenome also physically exists, it too can be recreated and restored. In the early stages of development, cells don't have a unique epigenome, so they don't have a unique role. These are stem cells. Now just because stem cells are blank slates doesn't mean their epigenome is empty. No, 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 no. They have an epigenome just like any other cell. It just so happens that unlike almost all other cells, stem cells are happy to change their epigenome. Since an epigenome is a product of genetic information, then the information to create the epigenome of a stem cell must be stored somewhere within our DNA. If we could find these proverbial compressions left behind when our cells were stem cells, or very young, then we could reconstruct the cell back to its original youthful state. And this is no longer a fantasy. Yamanaka factors are genes that encode for the creation of stem cells. If you activate the correct combination of these genes, you can convert a cell back into a stem cell. Now this isn't entirely helpful when it comes to aging, because if you completely wipe out a cell's identity, well, that's the same issue we're trying to solve. Not to mention, stem cells are highly replicative with many oncogenes and pose a serious risk for cancers or tumors if not monitored closely. But they are a very good starting point, as the very next stage in a stem cell's life is becoming a newly formed and differentiated cell. And it's that cell structure that we want to command our epigenome to emulate. This search has led to arguably the most fascinating research currently happening in the medical field. In early December of last year, 2020, the first paper of its kind was published highlighting the successful implementation of this exact concept. Central nervous system neurons are notoriously awful at aging. Any significant damage to one of these cells and they kind of just give up and die. The genetic instructions for creating and differentiating these neurons seems to get written over very early in an organism's life. So of all the cells in an organism's body that would best benefit from reversing aging, it would be these. Researchers, by implementing one of the many Yamanaka factors, in this case the gene OSK, were able to regenerate a damaged ganglion nerve cell in mice. And not only that, but restore vision in a separate in vivo trial. And this was accomplished by making the cells young again. DNA methylation is another way of gauging the age of someone. The more methyl tags on your DNA, the older you are. After being damaged, ganglion nerve cells rapidly accumulated methyl tags on their DNA. You can think of methyl tags as bike locks to genes. 
If a gene gets methylated, the gene can no longer be useful. If you lock up all of the useful genes, the cell just dies, which is exactly what happens. However, after being crushed, copies of the OSK gene sequence were inserted into the cell's genome. Instead of simply dying as one would expect, the neuron with the OSK gene sequences started regenerating its axons. This is a big deal! Central nervous system neurons do not do this. The presence of the OSK gene not only stopped the accumulation of the DNA methylation, but also reverted the epigenome to a youthful state via a still not understood mechanism. In its newly youthful state, the neuron, and subsequently its epigenome, somehow unlocked access to the genes that allow a neuron to grow. This is a landmark discovery. But that's just one cell. How can this be used on an organism? Old mice, just like humans, unfortunately see their vision degrade with age. The most common ailment is glaucoma. Researchers sought to see if OSK gene therapy also worked in vivo or on living organisms. This was accomplished by injecting them with an adeno-associated virus that carried the OSK gene. This virus can be activated through a chemical fed to the mice in their water supply. After receiving OSK treatment, old mice saw an increase in visual acuity and synaptic activity. An mRNA analysis of the epigenome of these older mice showed 90% of their epigenetic factors were restored to concentrations equivalent to younger mice, meaning these mice had fundamentally youthful neural cells. This is only the start of a very exciting future in age-related research. But age reversal technologies and treatments are still one to two decades away from seeing any results in humans. Stopping aging and considerably slowing it down, however, is something we can do today. Sirtuins are, as we are discovering, the most important protein in our cells when it comes to aging. If you haven't watched the last video, I recommend it to understand their role and why they are so important. Like all things, in order for sirtuins to be useful, they need a little bit of energy. Sirtuins get their energy from a molecule called nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, or NAD. In its oxidized state, NAD assists sirtuins performing their DNA regulation tasks. As we age and the years pass by, the concentration of NAD in our liver and muscles decreases, and now sirtuins are missing a lot of their supporting molecule. This means less sirtuins can do their jobs, which means a higher percentage of them are actively repairing DNA damage and not suppressing unwanted genes. This produces epigenetic noise and a loss of cell identity. Epigenetic noise is not a conclusion. Proteins only have a half-life of about two days, so if your cell learns to stop producing these errant proteins, pretty soon they will degrade, go away, and your cell can go back to increased efficiency. But that's only if you have your sirtuin stopping them from being created. And here enters our new treatment. By boosting the NAD levels in our cells, we see an increase in sirtuin activity and marked improvement of epigenetic noise. But most importantly, we see an increase in vitality and lifespan. And we are seeing these results today. Old mice show signs of rejuvenation after receiving NAD boosters. Yeast can live 30% longer, and without a doubt, my personal favorite study, old mice regain fertility. In a recent study on elderly mice, it was shown the concentration of NAD in the oocytes, or eggs, of mice greatly decreased over time compared to the ovary tissue around them. By supplementing the mice with NAD boosters, the concentration of NAD in the oocytes also increased. This was accompanied by an increase in oocyte diameter, rate of spindle organization, the viability of potential offspring, and number of offspring per mouse. The mice used in the study were 12 months old, the equivalent of a 58-year-old person. This is just another instance of the possibilities of age-related research and benefits to people. But mice, yeast, and roundworms aren't humans. So who cares, right? Well, these things take time, and good science needs good data. If we want to assess how these practices affect humans, we need to see its effects over a lifetime or a significant portion of it. Mice live two to three years, so it's a lot quicker to see results with them. That doesn't mean there aren't currently studies of the very same molecules given to mice and humans right now, because there are. 
and so far the data is very promising. But a good scientist will never speak fact until it's been replicated multiple times in different settings. However, it's looking like we can drastically reduce a person's aging today and now. And it's starting to no longer seem like science fiction that we will be able to reverse aging in the not so distant future. Some may question whether this should happen at all. What about overpopulation or the increased gap between the wealthy and all of us? Now these debates could go on and on and have merit, but one thing that's not a debate is the fact that the elderly suffer. Some in unimaginable ways like dementia and Alzheimer's, others in more inconvenient ways like joints and muscles that no longer work the way they used to. At the heart of almost all scientific conquests is the pursuit of using our newfound knowledge to benefit our fellow man. Nothing is more rewarding than to see one's discovery and hard work improving the lives of others. So if there is a way to reduce the suffering of a subset of our population, I see it as an obligation as a scientist to try to help.